Welcome back to Intro to Stats. Today we're talking about probability and sampling, and we'll continue this topic into another couple of videos following this, but this will provide a foundation from which we can continue to build. So when we talk about probability, what we mean is the frequency of times an outcome occurs divided by the total number of possible outcomes. So you can think about this as the relative frequency, where we're taking the frequency of a particular outcome and then dividing by the total number of scores or the total number of outcomes. And so we could reformat it as frequency of times an outcome occurs divided by the total number of possible outcomes. And if you think back to when we did frequencies, the saying that I had for relative frequency was if you can divide, you can do relative frequencies. So this is very similar to what we were doing before, and we're going to continue to build on that, but at the basic level, that's what we're doing. So when we say the probability of a certain outcome, here we have that represented as the probability of x, and we can write that out as the probability of x is equal to the frequency of x, f of x, divided by the sample space. And personally, I find that terminology a little weird, but that's the terminology that SPATS uses, so to keep it consistent with the book, I'm going to use that. But really when we say sample space, what we mean is the total number of possible outcomes that can occur in a given random event. So we have P of X, probability of X, is the frequency of X divided by the total number of possible outcomes. So let's make this concrete. So if we're talking about the probability of an event, if we had a container with a bunch of marbles in it, and we had 10 red, 10 blue, 10 green, we could pull a marble out of that. So we have 30 total marble, 10 of each of these three colors, and we could ask, well, when we pull a marble out, what is the odds of selecting a green marble? So what is the P probability of green? So now instead of X, which is just there as a placeholder, just like when you were doing algebra, now we're going to say, what is the probability of a particular thing, a probability of, in this case, a green marble? Well, there are 10 green marbles. So if we want to know P of X, probability of green, we need to know the frequency divided by the sample space. So F of X, frequency of X is 10. The total sample space is 30. So that's the total possible outcomes, the total number of marbles that we could pull. And so the probability of green, given that there are 10 greens, that's the frequency, divided by the total number of marbles is 0.333, and it's continuing. Of course, in this class, we're going to round everything to four digits while we're working, and then report two digits when you actually put your answers in. So we could then just simplify this to 0.3333. Now, when we do the sampling, we can sample without replacement or we can sample with replacement. So the real question is, we pull that first marble, maybe it's green, maybe it's not, what do we just do afterwards? Do we put that marble back or do we leave that marble sitting out on the table next to us and then pull out a second marble? So when we go to pull out the second marble, that's where we really have to determine what is our method. Are we sampling without replacement or are we sampling with replacement? When you sample without replacement, the marble stays on the table. So it doesn't go back into the bag, it doesn't go back into the container. So basically sampling without replacement is a method of sampling in which participants or scores or marbles, whatever it is that we're working on, once they're selected, they're not put back, they're not replaced before we select the next participant, score, marble, again, whatever we're working with. Now, in contrast, what we actually more often do is we assume sampling with replacement whenever we're doing calculations or probability. And sampling with replacement, basically the marble or the person or the score goes back into the bag so that it could be pulled again the second time. So let's look at how this looks with calculations. So we still have 30 marbles, still 10 red, 10 green. We pull the first one, and come to find out, we get a green marble. It is now out of our bag. So now we have 29 marbles in the bag, and there are 
10 red still, 10 blue, but only 9 green. So the probability that we would pull a green the first time was 0.3333. Now, if we're sampling without replacement, that marble stays out of the bag, maybe on a table or something. And then because of that, our probabilities change. So we have nine marbles in the bag that are green. Now we have a total of 29 marbles in the bag. So the frequency of X, the frequency of green is now nine. The total sample space is 29. So we're gonna have an opportunity of pulling it, a probability of pulling it of 0 0.3103. So our chance of pulling it another green one on the second time has now been somewhat reduced because we happened to pull a green one the first time. Now, if it, we're looking at red, our odds of red, so the odds of all of them when we started were 0.33333, right? There was a one in three chance because it was evenly split with 10 red, 10 blue, 10 green, and there were 30 total. The odds that we pull red this next time would be slightly elevated, 0.3448, if we were to select without replacement. Now, we could, by contrast, put the marble back in. And if we put the marble back in, right, and we sample with replacement, then the first time we pull a marble, the odds of green are 0.3333. The second time, if we're doing it with replacement, the odds stay the same because every time I pull a marble out, the marble goes back into the bag or the score or the person go back into the pool of possible scores, possible participants that we could pull. So when we do this, no matter which method we use, we should find that the probability, the outcome, if we add all possible outcomes together, always equals to one. So if we look at this, the odds of green on that second pull would be 0 0.3103. The odds of red would be 0 0.3448. And the odds of blue would be 0 0.3448 as well, because we have 10 reds, 10 blues, with 29 total marbles in the bag. If we add these together, we get 0 0.9999. That's really just a rounding thing. And as I've mentioned before, by having you do everything to four decimal places round to two, well, when we look at our third decimal place, that is a nine. So when we go to round, we end up rounding to one. Now it is important, you'll notice here that in front of the decimal point, I never put a number, I never put a zero. What that indicates to the reader or to somebody who's looking at my statistics later is that this measure that we're working with can never exceed one. And in fact, the relative probability, the relative frequency never can exceed one. And so when we add them all together, we find that the total probabilities, the total likelihood of, of all possible things within our bag, all possible scores within our sample is going to be equal to one. And if it comes out to anything else, my math is wrong somewhere. Now, the same thing somewhat happens with replacement. It's a little different because when I sample with replacement, I always put it back. So if I started with equal numbers of red, blue, green, every pool I have an equal number of red, blue, green. And so the odds of any one of them at any given time is one third, so 0.3333. However, when I add those together, I still get 0.9999, again, due to rounding. When we round that to two decimal places, it comes out to one. So whether I'm sampling with replacement, sampling without replacement, on every possible pool, the odds of all the possible outcomes, in this case, red, blue, green, should equate to one unless there's some missing data or something like if there were no browns but there were supposed to be browns or something like that. So assuming that all the data is available, assuming that all the scores or all the marbles are available and that they're in the bag, which they should be, then the odds of all the outcomes, when we add those odds together, those relative frequencies, it's going to come out to one. Now, we can take this same idea of probability where we're pulling marbles and we can apply it to other things where we treat the marbles or we treat the scores as a population 
and we say, okay, what happens when I pull these out? What were the probability of some outcome? And I can do that with anything. So I could do it with marbles. I could do it with eye color. I can do it with IQ, which is what I have here. And we're gonna treat these as a population of scores, a small population, only 10 scores. But I'm gonna treat it as a population and say, what is the probability of some particular score? So to understand this, we could organize these scores somewhat differently, tie an ID to them. So now the score of 92 is gonna be for the first participant. The score of 102 is for the second participant. The average of all these scores, if you were to add them all together, so sigma x, right, sum them all together, divide by the number of scores, which in this case is 10, it would tell you that the mu, the average is 100. I'm noting it as mu because I'm treating this as a population instead of a sample. And when we look at this, we could then also represent it as a histogram, basically. And now we have spaces because we have scores that aren't present because it's such a small sample. But keep in mind that a histogram, because this is a continuous variable, we only have spaces because there are data points that are missing. Like there's no 89, there's no 90, there's no 91. If we pulled a larger population, then that probably would slowly work itself out because we would end up with some people would have an 89 and a 90 and so on. You can see where the scores do touch though, like 92 and 93, there is no space present, thus indicating visually that there is a continuum underneath this. So this is the distribution for that. Now, from this, right, I can then randomly sample, pull, five scores, for instance, and I could pull any number of scores, but let's say that I want to pull a random sample of five scores. In this case, my random scores are going to be for participant five, participant four, participant one, participant four again, because I'm sampling with replacement. So I put four back in the pool, happen to pull that person again, and then participant seven. And the scores for each of those persons, so for the first person who was pulled, Participant five, their score is a 102. Participant four, their score is a 113. Participant one had a score of 92. Participant four again, 113. And then participant seven has a score of 93. And then I can get the mean from this. So I can sum those all together. Sigma X is 513. To get the mean of this sample, because now I'm treating it as a sample, that I've pulled from the larger population. So this random sample from the larger population, 513 divided by five is going to give me 102.6. I'm gonna keep the zeros out there just to remind you, we always wanna do everything to four decimal places while we're working. Because if I use this mean to then calculate the standard deviation or something, I don't wanna end up cutting off decimal points and then potentially mess up a calculation later on due to those rounding issues. So we can look at this and we see that we have a population, big N of 10, a sample, little n of five from that population. And I could do this a number of times. And in fact, if I wanted to do this for all possible unique samples with replacement, I would actually have to do this 100,000 times. And we're going to talk in a later video. Don't worry. You're never going to have to do this 100,000 times. You don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I promise you. There are ways that we can basically approximate variability that we would expect to see from pulling all these samples. Because when we pull all these samples, we can then create what's known as a sampling distribution. So you can see here I've put in the 102.6. That was the first thing that I pulled. But if I did this a number of times, despite the fact that my original sample, my original population of scores was nowhere near what's called a normal distribution, and I'll show you what that means, the sampling distribution, where I pull all these possible samples, will end up being what's known as normal. So it will center around the population mean of 100, and it will have this bell-shaped curve to it where most of the scores happen at the mean, 
which in this case would be 100. That would be the highest column here where, there, where we see eight scores. So that's the most frequently occurring score. That also happens to be the median because the distribution will be symmetrical around the mean, meaning that there will be an even number of scores occurring above the mean, an even number of scores occurring below the mean. We also will see that the frequency of those outcomes becomes less and less as we move further away from the mean in both a positive and negative direction. So the mean, median, and mode in a normal distribution will always be equal because the mean will sit right at the middle. It will also be the 50th percentile. It'll be the median because half the scores occur above it, half the scores occur below it because it's not a skewed distribution. We'll talk more about that in another video. And it will also be the most frequently occurring score. In this case, we can see that it has an N, a frequency of eight. And we would do this numerous times. And again, fortunately, we don't actually have to do that because it turns out that with a little bit of a math, we can approximate this same information and we don't then have to calculate all these different scores. And what this is known as, this idea that the original distribution was in no way normal, but the sampling distribution is normal, comes from the central limit theorem. And what this theorem states is that no matter what the original distribution was, as we gather more and more samples from that population of scores, the distribution of the sample means, right? So the sampling distribution will be relatively normal. So even though the original set of data was not normally distributed, the original set of data didn't have this nice bell-shaped curve with the mean, median, and mode being equal to each other. The original distribution didn't have half the scores above the mean, half the scores below the mean. Even though that didn't happen in the original distribution, as I pull samples, the sampling distribution will have this as I pull more and more samples. So if I only pulled a few samples, it would begin to approximate this, but it wouldn't approximate it perfectly. But if I pull 100, 1,000, as I approach the maximum number with replacement, which again in this case would be 100,000, as I approach that, I would see this normal distribution emerge within those samples. Now, what I can also do, going back to probability, is once I understand the sampling distribution, then I can ask, what is the likelihood of a particular outcome? So here I've circled one of the means. Well, that mean only occurs one time. There are 64, and you can count them if you want. So if you look at the M's, there's 64 M's. So I've done this 64 times. When I did the sampling distribution, that mean only happened once. And so the odds, the probability of that mean are one over 64. So again, the frequency of that mean occurring, the f of x, in this case x, is the particular mean of interest. So the frequency of that mean happening is one out of the 64 that have been calculated. Thus, the probability of it is 0 0.0156. Again, we're going to talk more about this in later videos, but this provides you a brief introduction to these concepts and to the idea of probability, sampling, and how we decide the likelihood of a particular mean or a particular outcome. And then we use that when we get into hypothesis testing.